But if you have at least a five-year time horizon, a significant portion of that longer-term money should be invested in the stock market because, in effect, that's the only place where you're going to have a shot at beating inflation over the long haul, particularly when we talk about 7% inflation. A sane approach to investing in a rapidly changing market. Award-winning personal finance journalist Jonathan Clements joins us for this Wealth Track podcast. Hello, I'm Consuelo Mack with a lingering cold. On this week's Wealth Track podcast, our guest is Jonathan Clements, founder and editor of Humble Dollar, a free weekly newsletter giving conflict-free financial advice to tell you everything you need to know about money. And he knows a great deal. Jonathan was the personal finance columnist at the Wall Street Journal for nearly two decades where I got to know him and is an award-winning author of several personal finance books. Oh, it's great to be talking to you once again, Consuelo. Jonathan, these feel like very unsettled times for investors. Inflation has surged. The Fed is shifting from easing to tightening. The stock markets are volatile and bond yields are still near historic lows. And that, of course, is before you throw Russia's invasion of Ukraine into the mix. What is your assessment of the forces swirling around the markets? Well, the first thing people should realize is that we always live in unsettled times. Every year, for as long as I've been writing about the markets, for almost four decades, there's always been a good reason not to be an investor. And if we allowed those reasons to prevent us from investing, we would never have enjoyed the fabulous gains that we've seen over the past four decades. So the first thing you should say to yourself is, this too shall pass. But obviously, that's not going to get us all the way through the podcast recording, Consuelo. So let's <laughs> dig in a little deeper. And probably the, the number one thing that is on people's minds these days as investors, rather than as citizens concerned about the world, right. the number one thing they're concerning investors today is, is inflation. Uh, right. We've seen these resurgence of inflation. We went from inflation that was regularly below 2% to suddenly being above 7%. And that is a huge issue for us as investors, because if we're going to make our money grow over the long haul, we have to earn returns that outpace the twin threat of inflation and taxes. That was a whole lot easier when inflation was below 2%. Now that it's above 7 at least briefly, making our money grow over time suddenly seems extremely difficult. I like your emphasis. Rather than saying our goal should be to beat the market, it's basically to beat inflation uh, and also taxes. So how difficult uh, is it to beat them with inflation at 40-year highs? It's extremely difficult, Consuelo. As investors, we have three basic investment choices. You know, we can put our money in cash investments, You know, buy CDs from the bank, put it in a savings account, buy a money market mutual fund. Well, we all know what that'll get us these days, which is pretty much zero. We could go out and buy bonds. Today, if you buy a 10-year treasury note, you're going to get about 2%. Well, that's a long way from 7%. It's even further from 7% once you figure in taxes. And so that leaves us with the third alternative. And what I would argue is the only alternative, which is to invest in the stock market. Now, I'm not saying that you should take every penny you have and put it in the stock market. If you have money that you're going to need to spend in the next five years, it should be nowhere near the stock market. You don't want to find yourself in a position where you're selling shares at fire sale prices. But if you have at least a five-year time horizon, a significant portion of that longer-term money should be invested in the stock market because, in effect, that's the only place where you're going to have a shot at beating inflation over the long haul, particularly when we talk about 7% inflation. Is there anything that we can do to give ourselves a competitive edge uh, when market valuations are so high and also where yields are so low. So let's unpack that a little bit. If you have money that you're going to need to spend in the next five years, it shouldn't be in stocks. It should be in cash investments. It should be in bonds. If you're putting money into the stock market, yes, you should probably need at least a five-year time horizon. So in essence, mm -hmm. what we're saying is, you know, if you're 10 years from a financial goal, you might put that money in stocks initially. And then once you get within five years of that goal, then you're going to want to be easing out of stocks, preferably selling when markets are closer to an all-time high rather than in the midst of a bear market. So let's say you have that 10-year time horizon. 
what are you going to do to ensure that you capture the great returns that the stock market has delivered historically? And the answer is really pretty simple. I mean, one, you know, you want to be broadly diversified. And that means you want to own not just U.S. stocks, but also foreign stocks. Uh, what we know from history is that there are periods when the U.S. stock market has done great, such as the 1990s, such as the 2010s. And then we know there are periods when foreign stocks have outperformed, like the 1970s, like the 1980s, like the early 2000s. I can't tell you, and nobody else can tell you with certainty what's going to happen in the decade ahead, but we do know that there are these different periods of dominance. And if we want to have a reasonable shot at earning decent returns, no matter what a market environment we have, you really want to own both US stocks and foreign stocks. And if I'm a betting man, which as you know, Consuelo, I'm not, but if I was a betting man, <laughs> I would bet that people who do not have money in foreign stocks over the next 10 years will be disappointed with their results. I mean, we've come off this period where foreign stocks have really done very badly. They started to look a lot better in 2022. And I would bet that that will persist. I'm looking at what's just happened with Russia invading Ukraine, and I'm thinking to myself, especially as far as European securities are concerned, uh, you know, do I really want to invest in Europe when the uh, atmosphere uh, and the geopolitical situation is so unsettled? I would say yes. I mean, we know that the markets are reasonably efficient, meaning that share prices reflect all the news that is available to investors. I mean, everybody knows that Russia has invaded Ukraine. Everybody knows that, that is going to create a threat to Europe. It is a threat to Europe. Mm -hmm. That's reflected in stock prices. Well, one of the standard pieces of economic wisdom is that if you want high rewards, you have to take risk. Yes, this is a risk. But for those who step up and own European stocks at this point, there is also a high potential reward. Sounds like kind of an active management strategy or at least actively rebalancing. How active should we be if we see a crisis, for instance, in Europe? Is this the time where we really should make a, a decision to step up and buy these beaten down securities? I don't believe it. that people should be market timing. I don't believe they should be moving money mm -hmm. in and out of major markets based on some sense for where they're going to go in the weeks and months ahead. What I do believe is that people should be broadly diversified. And once they've settled on the portfolio they want, let's say you decide that you want 60% of your money in, in US stocks and 40% in foreign stocks. And then outside of that stock portion, let's say you want to have 30% of it in bonds to complement the let's say 70% that you have in stocks. Once you've set on, settled on those target percentages, you know every year or so, or whenever we get a major market move, you should be rebalancing back to those target percentages. Uh, this rebalancing has been referred to as the only form of market timing that works. And the reason it works effectively is because you're not making any forecasts. You're simply reacting to what's happened in the past and then taking steps to make sure that your portfolio's risk level is in line with the targets that you earlier set. Now, the problem is when we get dramatic events like a spike in inflation, like Russia invading Ukraine, like the outbreak of the coronavirus, people throw all the rules out the window. They forget about the target allocations they settled on in calmer times, and they start making these big market bets. Go back to early 2020, Consuelo, uh, and I remember hearing from all too many investors that they bailed out of stocks during the early days of the pandemic because they were sure we were heading for a deep recession, even a depression. Right. And yet the stock market came roaring back. The, the bear market didn't even last five weeks. Don't imagine that you have any real insight into where the stock market is going. You know, one of the hardest things to say as an investor is, I don't know. But when it comes to the short-term direction of financial markets, that is the only rational response. The market timing hall of fame is a empty room. There is <laughs> nobody who has ever been able to predict the stock market 
on a regular basis. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> when I talk to everyday investors about their portfolios, the investors who seem most serene and also actually seem to be you know, quite well healed are those who own the boring funds. Mm -hmm. But if you go back you know, for years, going back to the 1920s, there have been balanced funds that own both stocks and bonds. And we're talking about you know, classic funds like Vanguard, Wellington, and Fidelity Balance Fund. Mm -hmm. And the people who own these funds are incredibly happy investors because essentially in that single fund, they have a reasonably well-diversified portfolio. It's easy to own. It doesn't need any maintenance. And they just sit there and let it compound over the years. And if you do that, good things happen. The problems arise when you try to be too clever, when you think you know better than the market, when you start fiddling around with your investment mix every month, every year, and suddenly there are these big market moves and you're left behind. So if you can't get it done on your own, if you can't build that portfolio that includes a variety of market sectors and rebounds regularly, then yes, buy a balance fund, buy a target date retirement fund, and just let your money ride. There is no shame in that. And in fact, a number of studies have indicated that you are likely to do better than people who are more active investors. Jonathan, is there anything that we should pay attention to in the, the macro or micro environment that might determine or at least affect our strategy? I think the way you... Investors should think about it as this. If an event occurs, and let's come back to the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, mm -hmm. if we have a major event like that, what investors should do is ask themselves, well, what does it mean for corporate profitability? And as best I can tell, it means very little. And if it doesn't affect corporate profitability, then it shouldn't have any lasting impact on the stock market. It doesn't mean in the short term that we won't get these wild swings as people vacillate between fear and greed. But if the fundamental profitability of corporations is not affected, the stock market should recover and move higher. If something happens that destroys the profitability of corporations, then we have a problem. And you know, at that point, you know, maybe if you do have cougarans buried in the backyard, it's a good time to go and dig them up. But as long as corporations are able to produce goods and services and people buy them and profits grow, for those who own broadly diversified stock portfolios, good things will happen. Corporate profits, more than anything, are the key to the stock market going up over time. Could we possibly think about there's a, a boom, we invest more heavily in stocks. And if there is a uh, recession that we lighten up? In theory, it sounds like a good idea, Consuelo. But the problem is the stock market looks ahead. So the stock market anticipates what's going to happen a year, two years into the future. Again, let's go back to the coronavirus crash in early 2020. Why did stocks come roaring back well, we we're in the midst of all this terrible news mm -hmm. it was because investors looked around and said, hey, you know, yeah, we, we're suffering right now. The economy is shut down, but they were anticipating that, you know, companies would continue to grow, the profits would recover, and they were making that bet. So if you can tell me when the next recession is going to occur, I would tell you to sell ahead of that, a year ahead of that, maybe. But given that you don't know, and I don't know, I think a much better strategy is to simply buy and hold. I mean, that's what I do. And I don't know anybody else who is smart enough to do otherwise. Jonathan, you are a great believer in simplicity and focusing on essentials in your retirement portfolios and your life, I might add. So you were doing the financial version of Marie Kondo before she ever came on the scene. So do you want to describe uh, your personal retirement approach to us? Well, one of the things that I wrote about recently, Consuelo, and was I have about a quarter of my portfolio in Roth accounts, accounts that are going to grow tax-free. Right. And I've made this assessment that I will probably not spend this money during my lifetime. And frankly, I don't even really want to think about it during my lifetime. So what I did was I took those accounts and I put them all in one fund. 
I put them all in the Vanguard World Stock Market Index Fund. It's a fund that essentially owns all companies of any significance from around the world. Um, recently, it was about 60% in US stocks, 40% in foreign stocks. And I'm not betting on US stocks. I'm not betting on foreign stocks. All I'm betting is that over time, the global stock market will rise. And by buying this fund, I am guaranteed to have a piece of whatever gains occur. You said that you're not planning to use that money in your lifetime. So you're just going to let it compound and appreciate. But what about the money that you are planning to live on in your retirement accounts? How are you handling those funds? So I have about a quarter of my money, as I said, in these Roth accounts tax-free that I right. plan to just let ride and, and leave to my two kids, uh -huh. uh, who will, of course, remember me fondly forever. <laughs> and then... <laughs> they would anyhow, then... Jonathan. <laughs> Well, this is like the icing on the cake, it Consuelo. True. <laughs> so they will not only remember me, but they will actually remember me fondly. This is the key. <laughs> the, uh, the rest of my retirement money is in a traditional IRA, and I will be compelled starting at age 72 to start drawing this money down. And indeed, this is where I'm going to go to get my living expenses. And in terms of that account, I have roughly 80% in stocks, and it's in a broadly diversified mix of index funds. And 20% of it is in uh, bonds, uh, a short-term government bond fund and also a short-term inflation index bond fund. And the reason I settled on that 20% bond, 80% stock mix is, you know, I plan to spend about 4% of my money every year. If I pull out 4% and I want to make sure I'm okay through a five-year bear market, that's how I get to 20%. Mm -hmm. uh, you would pull the 4% out of the, the bond investment, the fixed income investments. Yeah, if the stock market was down, right, right. and then I would um, replenish it when the stock market was doing well. It's very simple. Uh, so that's you know, its role I, as opposed to, you know, people talk about, well, number one, bonds, which really don't give much income these days. Uh, and they also talk about it as a stabilizing force in a portfolio. So historically, Consuelo, bonds have served three roles in a portfolio. They have, as you mentioned, been a, a buffer against stock market decline. Mm -hmm. They provide a cushioning impact, and they are still very good at doing that. Uh, second, uh, they are a potential source of income. Well, that is no longer true. True. You know, when, yeah. when bonds are yielding less than 2%, you cannot put your money into a collection of bonds and then expect to live on the income unless you're extraordinarily rich. And then third, bonds are a place to raise cash from. When the stock market is down, you know you may not get any income or not much from your bonds, but you can sell them and be pretty sure when you go to sell them that they are worth roughly what you paid for them. Mm -hmm. So when I look at my portfolio, yes, bonds provide a a cushioning effect should the stock market go down. But much more important to me, it's a part of my portfolio that I know when I need to pay the grocery bill, I can go and I can sell some of those bonds and I will get back pretty much what I paid plus maybe a little bit of interest. And Jonathan, why not put your entire retirement accounts into a Roth IRA? Uh, I would potentially consuelo, but one, you know, the tax code is written in such a way that right. it's actually worth having a, a little bit of uh, taxable income every year. You know, you get the standard deduction. That amount is going to be tax-free. Uh, the next buckets of money are taxed at 10 and 12%. That's pretty cheap um, tax rates. Mm -hmm. So I would argue that even if I was offered the opportunity to convert my entire traditional retirement account to a Roth, I would resist that because you always want to have a little bit of taxable income to take advantage of those lower tax brackets and of the standard deduction. One of the things that target date funds do uh, is that as you get older, they decrease your equity portion and increase the bond portion. I remember Jack Bogle from Vanguard uh, recommending that you know whatever your age is is what you should have in bonds, which would be really extreme uh, at this point. But uh, if you're 80, for instance, what's your thought about, you know, gradually decreasing your equity positions and increasing your fixed income positions as you get older? Well, I certainly think you should increase it, your your bond position as you approach the 
the point when you're going to be living off your portfolio. But once you get to the point of retirement and you have enough in bonds and cash to cover the next five or six years, I'm not sure it's necessary to go um, any further. And that brings me back to target date funds. So I'm a big fan of target date funds for people who are saving money for retirement. It's definitely a no brainer, simple way to accumulate money for retirement. But one of the problems with target date funds is that even after you reach your target date, even after you reach age 65, the allocation to stocks continues to decline. And most of the funds I've looked at bottom out at about 30% stocks. Mm -hmm. And I do not want to end up with that small an allocation to stocks. So while I like target date funds for people who are saving for retirement, I would be inclined to look at some other options once you get to your retirement years, because I don't want to be that low in stocks and hence that exposed to the long run threat from inflation. Because the beauty of stocks is that they post inflation beating gains. If you have too much in bonds, you really are a potential victim of rising prices over time. And remember, even if inflation is just two or three percent, it's going to halve your the, the value of your money, you know, over 25 or 30 years. So, Jonathan, the one investment for a long term diversified portfolio, what should we all own some of? Well, I would go back to that fund I mentioned that I put into my Roth IRA, mm -hmm. the Vanguard World Stock Market Index Fund. It's available as both an exchange traded fund, which means you can buy it no matter where you have a brokerage account, or you can buy it as a Vanguard mutual fund from Vanguard. That, I think, is the simplest solution for people who want broad stock market exposure. But as we've discussed, you clearly also want to have some bonds and cash investments to cover any upcoming spending. You don't want to have the kids' tuition money sitting in the Vanguard World's Total World Stock Market Index Fund. You want to have that sitting in bonds or cash to do for the retirement money that you're going to spend over the next five years. Jonathan, thanks so much for joining us for our WealthTrack podcast. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Consuelo. Thanks for having me on. Jonathan Clements, thank you so much for sharing your perspective and financial wisdom. To learn more from Jonathan Clements, go to his website, humbledollar.com. And for our previous interviews with Jonathan, go to wealthtrack.com and please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. In the meantime, make the week ahead a healthy, which when I get over this cold, I will be healthy again, profitable and productive one.